Hey again, everyone. Uh, welcome to module seven, where we're going to be talking about food globalization and world hunger. World hunger is arguably one of the largest public health threats related to the food system. So in this lecture, we're going to be looking at empirical data on, on world hunger, and then also some of the varying perspectives on understanding why um, this issue persists. <clears throat> So to begin with, um, I wanted to share a definition uh, from the United Nations. So the United Nations defines hunger as the distress associated with the lack of food. The threshold for food deprivation or undernourishment uh, is fewer than 1,800 calories per day. Now, under, undernourishment goes beyond calories to signify deficits um, in energy, protein, and or essential vitamins or minerals. Now, we know that hunger exists in a world that produces enough food for everyone, which makes it really a very troubling um, issue, particularly when talking about public health, um, the public health of the, the globe. Uh, hunger, as we just talked about, is defined in various degrees of undernourishment, from malnourishment to um, what's called wasting, um, which means acute malnourishment. Undernourishment is the leading cause of infant mortality, and as many of you probably know, uh, women and children are really at m the most at risk of, of hunger and malnutri malnutrition and the health consequences related to it. So preschool children and pregnant and nursing uh, mothers suffer the most from chronic undernourishment. Interestingly, um, the numbers on world hunger are um, a little bit different depending on what organization we look at. You know from your reading, the World Health Organization has the current tally, at least from 2019, at around 821 million uh, people in the world facing uh, chronic hunger. This diagram is actually from um, the Food and Agricultural Organization um, it, it, within the United Nations and has a little bit of a higher number. Now, it probably um, wouldn't surprise many of us that the 2020 data might actually be higher than even 900 million um, in the globe suffering with undernourishment or, or chronic undernourishment and hunger. So I did want to show you this visual um, to kind of give you a representation of what countries and areas um, in the globe are facing um, uh, the highest rates of hunger. So... Um, what continents uh, are facing the highest uh, highest rates of, of hunger. So here um, we have Asia and the Pacific, um, which has the highest proportion of um, people uh, facing facing hunger. Sub-Saharan Africa is next, Latin America and the uh, Caribbean, and then the Near East and North Africa um, is, is up here, followed by developed countries. Um, so it's also, I think, an important thing to know, um, as you know from your reading, that the sustainable development goal of zero hunger by 2030 uh, seems like it is uh, a far, a really a far reach at this point, given um, climate change and conflict and the economic, the economic slowdowns that have really been um, the roots of um, chronic, chronic hunger and um, malnutrition that is um, plaguing many parts of the world. So let's take a look um, at a map here. Again, we see this 800, uh, 821 million people, so one in nine in the world population don't have enough to eat. And I wanted to just, again, give you a visual to show um, where some of these countries are located. Again, we can see in Africa, um, in places like Zimbabwe and Madagascar, and then also um, places like uh, North Korea. So, um, and these are the places suffering with the highest um, and, and most acute forms of hunger and, and, the, most po and the largest uh, number uh, within the population that are facing hunger and malnutrition. Uh, although we can see that there are um, many other places in the globe that are suffering from undernourishment um, in ways that they, they don't need to when we could have a system that could work um, more equitably for, for everyone. So why does this happen? Um, if there's an agreement that world hunger uh, does not need to happen and that there's enough food, um, although there's um, varying ideas about how to grow that food, I think that most scholars and scientists agree that there is enough food to feed um, uh, the population on, on the earth right now. 
So one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, this is not in your reading, but I think it's an interesting way to think about um, hunger and, um, and inequality is world systems theory. So world systems theory was de developed by a sociologist, um, Emmanuel Wallerstein, that argued that we need to think about the globe um, in terms of core and periphery zones. So world systems, according to Wallerstein, is dominated by core countries, um, sometimes one core uh, country that he called the hegemonic state. And um, these places really enjoy um, the production and financial dominance over the rest of the uh, over the rest of the world. So internationalizing production allows business owners and firms and organization uh, to have easy labor um, that is um, uh, from other places uh, in in the globe. So we can think about this as related to the food system and importing foods and who is doing the labor in terms of making uh, in, in um, making that food and how far our food travels and that um, and that the the core countries uh, as he would argue in our places like the United States Germany and Japan are really exploiting uh, periphery zones and periphery countries so poorer countries that provide cheap labor labor and natural resources to core to core countries places like Vietnam and Nigeria and Colombia so um, instead of thinking about independent nations, really thinking about these zones in terms of power and, and really exploitation of labor and natural, uh, natural resources. So the other thing that I think is really important about this um, theory is that it really takes away the visibility of exploitation. So citizens in core countries don't necessarily see the periphery countries because this exploitation is really out of sight. Um, when it's happening in, in a globalized capitalist system, which is what our food system, um, the, the dominant food system, is this kind of global capitalist um, uh, international system. But it's hard to bring about social change when this exploitation is really, um, is really out of sight. So I just wanted to introduce this, um, this theory to you to, in, if for you to, to kind of like think about world hunger and why world hunger persists um, again, when there is enough food for everyone. Next, um, this is from your reading from William Witt um, on the varying kind of like political ideologies related to um, a world hunger and, and the perspectives on world hunger. Now, I don't agree with um, the conservative uh, point of view. It's an interesting um, bookend, so to speak, in terms of political ideology, but this notion of tolerating hunger as a natural, po as a natural process and kind of a carrying capacity and population control. Um, and then following that is the liberal perspective um, that you read about. And this is this kind of like idealistic and reformist ideology. So the notion that developed countries through altruism and money and technology will be able to um, help underdeveloped countries um, in, in, related, in, in producing enough food and, and getting rid of world hunger, and getting rid of hunger um, where, it where it persists. So, but within this perspective, there's really no pushback on capitalism and globalism. So those systems, um, capitalism and globalism uh, uh, remain in place and we can use them to help underdeveloped countries. There are a lot of people, um, you might be skeptical, there are people who are um, somewhat skeptical, skeptical about um, what systems can remain in place and simultaneously um, fight world hunger. Lastly is this um, neo, -nar neo Marx perspectives, and, and this has to do with um, really arguing that local kind of governments in a m more of a socialist kind of perspective um, need to direct food and make sure that um, populations are getting food. Very um, critical of food and financial aid, so the World Bank and the World Trade Organization really breeds dependency from this perspective. And then the focus is on food security and empowerment. So really arguing um, within this perspective that money should stay within the hands of those who are producing the food, that that money should not leave um, the, the region or the country where it's being uh, produced. So um, an interesting way to think about hunger and this perspective, um, perspective on, perspectives on hunger. Lastly, um, you read uh, an article, Want Amid Plenty, and this is a really, um, 
I think this is an again another interesting way to think about hunger. This notion of like the seduction of hunger, and in this article, it's um, we're really we're really reading about inequality, but this um, allure to hunger as um, as an issue is because those those who are really interested in it. Um, are able to ex explicitly kind of like reject ca capitalism. So hunger shows the absurdity of capitalism uh, in our in our food distribution systems and in our food system, that they are contradictory um, really to to each other. Um, there's emotional salience. So hunger has this capacity to arouse sympathy and mobilize action, and um, and we can certainly see that um, in in a lot of campaigns and organizations that are working to fight uh, to fight hunger. So there's also um, uh, hunger. The seduction of hunger is also prevalent because of um, entitlement cuts. So this is that um, when entitlement cuts um, happen in terms of any. Uh, food aid programs that come from the federal government, uh, particularly in the United States, that we see um, local emergency aid go up. So, um, so the seduction of hunger is really uh, to suggest that we need entitlement programs; that um, those are safety nets for the po for the population to make sure that um, they're able to get food um, again in the United States. And then there's this sense of solidarity. So progressives are drawn to hunger issues um, because it makes them. Uh, feel connected um, to those who are in, who are in need. However, this article I think really clearly articulates that hunger is not the central issue. Um, that it is certainly an issue and it is a public health issue. Um, but that uh, those who are in poor populations, they are there is hunger, um, but it's only one issue among others. Um, there are issues of rent and um, how to pay for heat and livable wages and how to get health care and um, transportation and how, where does one get uh, good food. So hunger is really a symptom of poverty and not, and not the cause. So to, to really think about these underlying structural issues um, instead of just focusing um, maybe on, on the outcome of the issue is the argument I think um, most prevalent in this, um, in this article. And really thinking about why aren't there campaigns to end, bigger campaigns to end um, poverty and, and inequality. So and again, just another interesting way um, to think about uh, the issue of hunger. And um, there are other perspectives and um, I'll look forward to hearing more from you on what your perspective is.